Richard Nixon is nothing but an old windbag. And if everyone else decided to jump off the Empire State Building, would you? Go back to the funny farm where you belong, Schultz. And these athletes call themselves professionals. If you have spent any significant amount of time with my father over the years, you may have heard him utter one of these fiery phrases. And if I had to use one word to describe my father, it would be passionate. He was passionate in his opinions, his pursuit of his hobbies, passionate in his love and commitment to his wife, children, and grandchildren, and passionate in his devotion to his faith, this parish, and this community. Fred Boyce was probably the most well-read person I have ever known in my life, and his appetite for books, newspapers, and magazines was insatiable. My father knew something about everything, and you could have lengthy conversations with him about sports, politics, corporate takeovers, or the opera, and he always had something new to bring to the table. He was good company. I enjoyed speaking with him about government and current events because he usually had a unique perspective delivered with his own personal flair. Bloomberg was always a bum. Rudy Giuliani thinks he's a king. And I can't even say the words he saved for Richard Nixon. My father disliked Richard Nixon long before Watergate. He was furious with his role in the McCarthy hearings and held it against him always. I am sure we were the only kids in Manchester, Missouri, sporting McGovern buttons in 1972. Dad was passionate about sports and his favorite teams, the Giants, the Yankees, the Rangers, and of course, Notre Dame. If you ever had the pleasure of watching a sporting event with my father, you would remember it. He could be quite animated, and of course, the remarks he saved for the officiating were usually the most colorful. It did not matter whether it was the New York Knicks, Our Lady of Victory Tigers, or St. Francis de Sales CYO. Referees could be described with only two words, horrendous or atrocious. And it could be a mood changer. Oh, I remember walking in the front door and bumping into my brother Fred, and he looked me straight in the eye and said, Notre Dame just lost. I'd get out of here if I was you. But I have to say that some of my favorite family memories were spent watching sports together. I will always remember my father's sheer disbelief when Secretariat won the Belmont Stakes or his delight when Iona crushed number one ranked Louisville at the Garden. And of course, his loud cheer when Plaxico Burris made the catch which sealed a giant victory in the Super Bowl. His passion for travel was renowned. He has been to every continent except Antarctica and each of the 50 states. He could give you the name of a great restaurant in a nearby Catholic church in every major city. My sister Mary Beth once asked me, now where is dad going this time? And I said, Mary Beth, I have no idea. He was mentioning cities and landmarks, and I was too embarrassed to tell him I had no clue what or where he was talking about. My father has scaled the Great Wall in China. He has stood beside the Sydney Opera House in Australia and ridden an elephant in Thailand. He has traipsed up the mountainside of Machu Picchu in Peru, and he has slept in a tent on the floor of the Sahara Desert. He has paid tribute to fallen heroes at the beaches in Normandy and at Pearl Harbor. He has ridden the camel in the shadow of the Great Pyramids, and he has walked the path that Jesus Christ took while carrying his cross in the city of Jerusalem. But if you ask my father what was his greatest adventure in life, he would tell you it was his marriage to Joan DeWire and the five children they raised together by far his greatest accomplishment. And while we did not have the economic means to take the trips my father was able to enjoy later in his life, he took advantage of everything the city had to offer. 
We would pile into the Blue Falcon station wagon and head off to the Museum of Natural History, the Cloisters, the World's Fair, and down the west side to see the naval ships. In fact, we are probably the only native New Yorkers I know who have actually been inside the Statue of Liberty. We went to Broadway shows and Radio City Music Hall. He took us on fabulous vacations here in Rockaway on the Irish Riviera with the Lynch DeWire clan and down to Seaside Heights, New Jersey with the old Bronx gang. It was a rich and wonderful life. And my father could be tough. He could give you one look that would stop you dead in your tracks. He expected you to work hard, get good grades, and be humble about it. But he was also the father who carpooled everywhere, attended every game, and saved every newspaper clipping and memento which showcased one of our accomplishments. We were first and foremost in his life. He put all five of us through Catholic grammar school, high school, and college, and I never once heard him complain about it. What a gift. And if it was possible, he enjoyed his grandchildren even more and attended every game, spelling bee, graduation ceremony, and sacrament that he could, beaming with pride. He was a wonderful husband. He called my mom his honey babe, and she in turn affectionately called him her cranky pill. Legend has it that they met at a dance at Our Lady of Mercy Gym when my mom was just 14 years old, and when she came home that night, she pronounced that she had met the man she was going to marry. They danced together in harmony for 38 years. They persevered through the joys and tribulations of married life. And when my mother was sick with leukemia, my father was at her side every step of the way. I cannot describe the utterly exhausting commute from Sloan Kettering to Rockaway Park, but my father did it, day in and day out, for weeks, sometimes months at a time, until my mom finally convinced him that they both needed a day off from each other. And it wasn't until my mother passed away that I realized what a great partnership they formed. I remember wondering what would become of our family because my mother seemed to be this vital force which glued us all together. But honestly, I didn't need to worry because we still shared long, glorious summer days on the beach, joyous birthday celebrations, and Christmas was just as big and better than ever. In corporate America, I believe it would be called a seamless transition. After my mother's death, there was a brief time when my father seemed to struggle a bit to find his new niche, but his tremendous faith, instilled by his parents, Fred and Mabel, and nurtured by the Irish Christian brothers at Power Memorial and Iona College, carried him through. And it was at this time when I personally witnessed how a community of faith can bring strength and comfort to an individual. My father was a daily attendant at the 6.30 Mass here at St. Francis de Sales, and he developed friendships with many members of the parish, first to the sign of peace. He laughed when Father Lou would tell him that many were concerned when he was gone for an extended time on one of his trips. They all sit in the same seat every day, and they look out for each other. He would take his bike to the summer classic and watch the basketball games, where he joined a cadre of men to cheer on and critique the high school ball players. It was there that Mr. Coogan first recruited him for the counting house. My father loved his work there. It gave him a renewed sense of purpose, and he thoroughly enjoyed spending his Monday mornings with Dorothy, the parish priests, and the members of the crew. The Rockaway community seemed to envelop him in his retirement, and I truly enjoyed when people learned that Fred, the man on the bike, was my father. What a nice man, was always the response. And I am personally grateful to the Blum family, immediate and extended, for adopting my father as one of their own during this time. His now daily trips to the beach changed neighborly acquaintances to fast friends. And as the disease wore him down and decreased his mobility, his friends on 140th Street were sure to check in on him and brighten his days, especially Marilyn Martin, whose hip replacement gadgets gave him all the shortcuts he was looking for, Bill Laffin and his girls who kept him laughing, and to dear Ed Conti, 
There is not enough red wine in the world to repay you for your kindness to my father. We will forever be in your debt. You know, you can't pick your parents, but we were doubly blessed. And as I find myself in the throes of parenthood, I marvel at the job my parents did. They raised five children who love, respect, and enjoy each other, with only a few bumps and bruises along the way. They said, I need to organize the office lotto pool, but I hate to break it to you. We already won the lottery when we were born to go. Over 25 years ago, I stumbled across the letter in Ann Landers that a woman wrote for her parents on the occasion of their wedding anniversary, and I cut it out, hoping to use it in the future, maybe in a toast at my parents' 40th. Well, we never got the chance to have that toast, but I thought there would be no better time to share it than now that Joan and Freddie are reunited once again, and I am sure they are dancing with joy to be with each other for eternity. To my parents, how do I say thank you for all the love and caring over the years? How do I repay all the nights you stayed up when I was sick and all the floors you walked when I was late coming home? What can I give you for all the times you supported me in my triumphs and provided a shoulder when there were losses? What present is there for all the times we just sat together and shared our warmth? How do I thank you for the guidance when I was unsure of my way and your restraint to allow me to find it myself? You nurtured my growth, yet allowed me my independence. How can I measure the worth of your love? What gift is enough? And the answer came to me today. No box can hold it. No wrapping can cover it. Nor can any ribbon tie it. No store has it on a shelf. My gift is not to you. It is to my children. For I promise to care for them when they are sick and walk the floors when they are late. I will share with them their victories and comfort them when there are losses. I will help them to grow, yet let them choose their own path. I'll be there when they need me and step aside when they must go alone. And someday, maybe, they will come to me and say, how can we thank you for all you have done for us? And I will tell them, don't thank me. Thank my parents. For I am the product of their love. And you are my greatest gift to them. Thank you, Dad. We had a wonderful life. <laughs>